want to talk to you today about, because I've been thinking a lot about audience. I was thinking through, we talked last time about kind of the, the goal is to be a little countercultural. Yeah. That's just kind of, that's part of your drive. I think that's part of what we were just talking about as far as like getting over this inertia that we feel about addressing these things. That there's just a certain amount of like cultural uh, complacence when it comes to learning about this stuff, because it's just not, it's not our instinct to do that. Right. So I think that that, that's an audience that you can speak to with like a lot of experience and know how to speak to them. And that's another thing I wanted to talk to you about as far as considering the audience, thinking about who you're talking to, what is like, is there a term for like our resistance to change in psychotherapy? I mean, defense. Defense. Okay. Is, is, is probably the term for that. So there's a natural defense against some of the things you're saying if it's not part of someone's practice currently. So beyond like the the conceptual differences or the conceptual understanding or the practical pieces that they may not be using, there's also a defense against a new way of seeing things or a new way of doing things. And I think right. that that... Right. So I think that defense is also super linked to the imaginal realm. And the reason I say that is I think about any time like working with you or like thinking by like, bringing awareness to some of these like resistances internally, mm -hmm. these defenses internally, it seems to bring me like again and again, like smack into the imaginal realm that there is this, uh, feel free to like weigh in. I think that's just kind of how I've been like seeing it lately. And it's why I wanted to ask you kind of, because a lot of the book as it's framed out so far is about talking about the subtle realm for psycho in, in psychotherapy. And I think that that, the relational aspect of that makes a lot of sense. And I think the personal aspect of it is really linked to the imaginal realm. What do you think about that? Well, I guess what I'd say is all the realms are always occurring. And so with any given person at any given moment, they may be aware of imaginal or they may be aware of emotional or they may be aware of tightness in their body, but they're all always happening. So it just depends on the person. Right. And defense is occurring in every, in every realm. You know, you could say that, like what a lot of people would tend to say is, def is that defense is emotional. And it's like, well, there's emotional defense always, but there's always mental defense also. So does that make sense that it's... Yeah. And <laughs> there's that, the way our culture tends to look at it is that the imaginal is insane, right? And that the physical, emotional, mental is, is what's real. And so, you know, the fact that you're saying that anytime a little bit of uh, defense comes up in you, you go into the imaginal, the <laughs> what's, uh, you know, what our, what's wrong with me, what our society would say is, cause it's kind of like, it, it brings to mind the incredible Hulk, for example. Right. David Banner is, is uh, you know, living in the 3D mental, emotional, you know, linear space-time world, which, which everybody thinks of as, okay, that's the normal guy. But then if he gets angry enough, you know, he shifts into this imaginal realm creature, which is the Incredible Hulk, right? And, you know, of course, they don't, they're not saying it that way in the show, but that, that's the idea. That's the symbolic idea if, you, if you're looking at this with the idea of imaginal um, in mind. So I'm hearing you say that anytime anyone even starts to do something you don't like, you're just going right into Hulk mode. I, so maybe. <laughs> I think that's, there's some truth to that. There's some truth. <laughs> I was, I was kidding, but. The, uh, well, I think, I think that. Uh, the Sky more, would agree with me. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, the more you uh, look at it, uh, Maybe, maybe I'm projecting it onto other people as well at that point. <laughs> but I think just with, when you talk about physical resistance in the body, yeah. I think it's a physical resistance to letting energy move, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's, and it could just be for me, so I won't say this is true for everyone, that there is 
that part of the resistance is to the imaginal realm aspect that's unconscious and not allowing the truth of that to move. Totally, yeah. Yeah, and that speaks to how much power, how much potential there is for healing and growth and change when you allow yourself to look at the imaginal. Because I agree, that's where the real change happens. You know, if the imaginal realm is considered more primary or a deeper realm or a more causative realm. So like within the sphere of consciousness, allowing imaginal forces to move and the deeper change that's possible as a result. Like they will change things regardless, just consciously or unconsciously. Right. Yeah. The the other thing that came up like pop culture wise in the last couple of days made me think about it was Sky and I watched the movie Constantine. Have you ever seen that? With Keanu Reeves? I don't think I've seen that. Okay. So Constantine uh is a guy. At one point he uh well he was seeing demons mm-hmm. when he was a kid. Uh his parents well, the way he put it is like they did what any normal parents would do and they made it worse. So they like sent him to shock therapy. He tries to kill himself. And ever since he's been like, uh, able to like interact with demons in the world. Okay. So he is like an exorcist. He's kind of like a, a supercharged exorcist. And like the plot is that he's trying to earn his way back into heaven by like banishing demons who are like overstepping their role in the world. But it's a very, like, imaginal realm, you know, yeah. allegory or analogy. Just thinking about, like, it, it's hard to to see that. Like, I see that. And I'm like, this is, like, what is going on. Like, this is part of the truth of of life and of what the world is like. Exactly, yeah. And how do you address that and the power and potential of that without seeming like, your Keanu Reeves flipping off demons. <laughs> right. You know? You're right. But I think, like, what, what really struck for me in watching it is that uh, I remember coming out of the, the hospital and looking in the mirror and, like, my face would change mm-hmm. in a way that it never has. And then there was no, like, container or context for that until working with you. And then, like, your face would change all the time. And I would say something, you're like, no, that's normal. I'm like, okay, cool. So we're good. <laughs> right. And it's like, everything's okay. My roommates aren't actually demons. Right. I'm just kind of like a little freaked out right now. So yeah. there's right. the... Uh, um, now, would so my I, face change into Keanu Reeves? I mean, it might now. I'll have to see next time I see you. Oh, yeah, right. Let me... <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel... I feel like personally drawn to that subject because it feels more um, immediate to me right now. Yeah. But the the outline that you have for this book so far, I really like. And I also want to kind of go down that route. So it could be like that we're kind of building towards that and we start with subtle because mm. subtle is a little more um, accessible in some ways. Right. There's just some terminology that's already there. But I, but I feel uh, the importance of that right now. Cool. And, and, and just to be fair, uh, am I joking about you? No, I know. I, know. Into, I, don't... I, uh, <laughs> I was going to say that I, if I come back to me, I mean, I, I'm experiencing imaginal almost full time. So apparently I've just thrown David Banner completely out and just decided to just stay the whole the whole time. Just hulk it up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Perfect. Perfect. I I feel like there cuz I mean you talked about tension in the body and I think when I it's almost like to to let there's just p- places I'm perpetually tense that like, you know, I notice and I can let go and like there's just things I do to try to to notice that because it starts to affect my, you know, starts to affect my mood and my emotions and my mind. That to to let that move feels like a shift into the imaginal immediately. 
So, so like you're saying, like that is that is probably part of my pattern to some extent. That's been unconscious. That is that is becoming more conscious uh, or conscious uh, aware of rather. But there's there's a real relief that I'm feeling in like in that shift. And we we've talked about how <clears throat> like when I experience an imaginal state, there is there is a sense in which the 3D world becomes blurry, like literally blurry. That I can focus on on a thing, but everything else around it, the field of vision becomes blurrier than it was before. And I think that I've just kind of seen the the value of that, or just be the the, the value of the awareness of that and not being uh, stuck in, oh, shit, it's blurry right now. Yeah, that's a, it's a big shift to, to get comfortable with that. And like you say, to not just conflate it with, uh-oh, 3D reality is literally warping. This is awful. How do I get it back in focus? <clears throat> it's such a tricky thing because it's like, okay, well, let's say, you know, I joke that, okay, I'm living in the imaginal all the time, which... Depends on what you mean by that, right? But I'm not walking around with everything blurry all the time. Right. But it's an analogy would be to pay, to pay conscious attention to your emotion, for example. And it's like, well, some people, some people are in touch with that quite a bit more often than others, right? Like they're just, th this idea of, of registering it, is, is the word I use, right? To, to register it in the, in the moment. Like right now, you're probably not registering your, how your feet feel, you know, but now that I just said that your mind right. might suddenly register, well, how, you know, how do my feet feel right now? Which um, is great. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> for me, smell is a thing. Like I don't, I don't pay much attention to smells. I, when I've sort of tested it, I seem to have, you know, an average sensitivity to smell, meaning my nose isn't broken or, or something. Although I think there is a certain, my nose has been broken enough times to where I, <laughs> I, 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 you know, th I think there's a reason I don't go to smell and part of it's because my nose has been broken, mm. but it didn't really damage my ability to smell. It made it so that I don't go there because there's trauma there. Mm -hmm. But I can go there and, you know, and if something is a strong enough smell or if someone calls attention to smell, then I go there. Whereas, you know, I work with certain clients and they, you know, they've talked about how smell is just a huge part of their life. Yeah. And it's, the, and it's, so it can be the same with emotion. Some people are much more in touch with their emotions than others. And, and so it, there's a similarity with that to, for example, the imaginal realm. It's like, to actually be able to discern the imaginal realm. Because again, everyone's being affected, right? Right. The idea is that I'm being affected by smell, whether I know it or not. I'm being affected by my emotions, whether I'm paying attention to my emotions or not. We're being affected by the imaginal. And, it, and to be able to discern that, just like it's important to discern, oh, that, that you know, experience you're having right now of being disgusted or of finding that that pleasure you're feeling it's like that's actually a smell <laughs> you know like if you didn't know you know your brain would just sort of create this idea but there are advantages to being able to discern oh that's a sound that's a sight that's a smell that's an emotion that's a thought and so with all this stuff it's like there's also subtle energetics there's also imaginal realm experiences there's also you know transpersonal non-dual experiences there's also conscious uh, awareness essence soul experiences there's 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 way more than just the five physical senses and there's a again there's advantages to being able to discern what dimension what realm what level it is that right now i think that's a, a valuable point you've made just in a good uh entry point to talking about subtle more specifically because if we're if we're if our audience is a therapist mental emotional would be kind of the typical things that are being looked at like what's your mental context right now what's your emotional context right now what are you thinking about what are you feeling what does it remind you of 
and maybe to some extent, like, where do you feel it in your body? Like what's, what are the physical effects of the way you're thinking or feeling right now? And then another layer onto that, that isn't being looked at as much is the subtle energetic. So if you, if your audience is a therapist who's looking at mental, emotional, maybe to some extent physical, how do you transition from mental, emotional awareness, awareness of mental states, of emotional states, maybe of a physical state? to awareness of a subtle energetic because if you're, you're talking about the way you framed it was you have all these experiences happening at once and then you have uh, the ability to become aware of a different type of experience so something that's going on regardless becoming aware of it so as a therapist you have uh, we'll just kind of assume an awareness of mental and emotional states how do you use that as a bridge to becoming aware of subtle states or subtle energetics? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, Cause it brings up that idea of it, it, is everyone capable of it or is it some kind of special gift or is it, does it require some kind of level of consciousness or cer a certain kind of awakening to be able to register it and you know, you hear different things in certain systems. It's the third eye that's capable of, of quote unquote, seeing subtle energy. Uh, in some systems, it's a, it's, it's via the heart or the heart chakra. You know, it's one of these things where it's a, it's a subtle energetic organ that sees subtle energy. So it gets really hard to, it, it's like in order to get someone there, they have to kind of already be, it's kind of like they got to already be there and then you just help them. It's like if someone can hear a key change in a song and then it's like, oh, that, that shift you just heard, that's called a key change. And then you can, you know, start to get this framework around that and start to be able to quote unquote, see or, or hear this, this form and this structure to music, right? Yeah. So some people can sit there and go, oh, wow, that was a, you know, that was a, this kind of timing and, the, you know, that key and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, geez, how are you noticing that? You know, how you, they must have this superpower where they can see the music in a certain way. And it's like, well, I mean, kind of, yes, but it's more like, it's more like, you know, they're still using their ears, but they, but their mind, you know, has grasped this certain kind of knowledge around it and, but we're not using our eyes to see subtle energy. There is a subtle energetic organ. And what I do, as far as a, the, the process of trying to help someone see it, what I've noticed is that people don't, it, it kind of goes back to the, the resistance or the defense thing you were talking about. It's like people will, they will notice it, they will register it, but then they'll, they'll quickly uh, deny it or kind of, pass it off as, as unreal. And so to be in a class where people are noticing subtle energies and then to get feedback from others that, that, well, they saw the same thing, you know, can be a way of, of helping a person start to, to allow it, you know, to allow that, that maybe they did see that. Yeah. Do you have, do you have an example of noticing subtle energy? An example of something that you'd reinforce there? Well, one thing I do with clients a lot is I'll, I'll say, okay, I'm going to bring my attention to your first chakra. And I do it, and then almost always they notice it. They feel different. Not only do I look different often, but they feel different. And, you know, and then they'll describe kind of the textbook things that go with first chakra. And then I'll say, okay, now I'm going to shift and I'm going to bring my attention to your second chakra. And then they... F Do you want to list some of those out? So with first chakra, it's like, yeah, I feel more suddenly in my body. I feel more of an awareness of the room, I, the, like the physical room. I feel more... Uh, sometimes it's like, yeah, I, that feels kind of scary or I feel kind of... I usually feel heavier. Yeah, right. Denser, heavier. And then I'll shift to second chakra and it's like, okay, that, that vibration feels a little lighter, a little less dense. Uh, it feels more emotional. It feels 
softer. It feels, um, I'm not so kind of focused on the room. I'm more in a kind of a watery space, less structured. Yeah. It shifts inward a little bit. And then it's like, okay, so do you still not believe in subtle energies? <laughs> you know? I mean, literally they'll, they'll describe those things, you know? And it's like, well, why do you think that's happening? You know, what, like, like what's happening right now? And then, you know, they'll say, well, I, you know, I'm not sure. <laughs> you're, uh, you're controlling people. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, what do you know? You know, and then what people want to do is it's like, well, yeah, I think it's your body language or I think, you know, I think it's the look in your eyes and I'm just kind of interpreting that, whatever. Well, we can just say like, as you're talking about it, we're doing it, right? Like that's happening in this conversation, that shift of awareness from first to second chakra. Right. And it'll be curious to see if people experience that along with us as we're talking about it. But I'm feeling it, as you mention it, because of bringing awareness to it. I'm having ways to describe it because I'm experiencing it. So we can rule out eye contact as the rationalization for what that shift is. <laughs> right. Why don't we keep going? Like, I think this is something we've talked about before but never described. I think we just keep shifting and describing these uh, chakras and what those kind of typical uh, things that people notice are. So in the third chakra, they'll notice another shift up in vibration, a shift towards mental Third's more mental. With third chakra awareness, there's a sense of individual self. And that, that's always a tricky thing because it's not like you don't have an individual emotional and an individual physical. But, but there's a sense of uh, individuality to the third. There's a, a sense of solar awareness, right? It's at the solar plexus. The solar plexus is the nerve plexus that correlates with the third chakra. There's a sense of personal empowerment, interpersonal relation. Well, I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting. The This is obviously, you know, this is my experience of it, and it's not going to be everyone's, but there's, there's a certain, I think what I am feeling is like an inward shift is that more personalized shift you're talking about from first to second to third that there's a certain aspect of second and first because of at least my relation to them that feels more alien than third. That like, while I know it's me and I know it's my experience, it's it's something I'm less, potentially less aware of. So it feels less like something I occupy as self. Yeah, well put. And then the shift from third to fourth is, uh, I mean, for some people it's psychotic, but I think it's uh, Richard Rohr's like first and second half of life is tied to the shift from third to fourth or awareness of fourth. The there's a would you say there's like an interrelational aspect to it that's less present in the first, second, and third? At least like that's kind of the the doorway to an awareness of it. It seems to me. I, I think what you're speaking to is the is the it's it, it's a big shift, a bigger shift than from one to two or two to three. Um, like you're saying, and it's it's uh, potentially quite disruptive because the first three are are individual self organized, right? It's like three different levels of individual. Whereas when you go to the four, it's 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 really beyond the individual. It's there. There's an awareness of a you know. It's it's like if you think of each chakra as a as a level of vibration or a medium or an environment, you know, that, that one is initially embedded in, right? And then your awareness comes up out of there. And so, for example, you know, it's like, let's say that, that, that two people are standing in uh, waist-high water or let's say, you know, right up to, uh, right above the, the solar plexus, right? Between the solar plexus and the thoracic. Um, and let's say your feet are, are buried in the sand. So let's say you and, you and I are standing there in, the, in, in that kind of situation. It's like, okay, well, both of us have our feet buried in the sand. So we're, it's like we're both on, on that level. We're both embedded just in, in, that, in that earth or in that, in that medium, 
right? And there's a certain amount of stuckness in that, right? We're not going to move around a whole lot. There's not a lot of freedom or, you know, there's less freedom to move about in that sand than there is in the water. So if you say the second chakra, let's say, is the water, but then your awareness might come up to, oh, there's this thing above the sand, which is this, this other environment that we would call the water. And it's like, well, there's a little more freedom to that, right? It's quite a bit softer than the sand, quite a bit more movement. And we're both in there. And there's an awareness that your feet are still in the sand, but now this, you know, your legs are in this water. And then your awareness can, can shift up into the air, right? Where you're up above the water. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. There's this, this third environment where we're also up here in this environment that's even more soft, even more freedom, even more spacious than the uh, water was. And with each of those, one of the things that goes on is it's like, well, if the, let's just say, <laughs> I don't know, let's say there was an earthquake. It's like, well, the, our feet being embedded in that sand, we're just going to get thrown about whichever way the earth's moving, right? If you, let's say you're stuck in a first chakra fixation. So now when the when the uh, earth's moving around and or when, this, when the water's moving around, you're going to be more just kind of subjected to whatever's happening. Whereas if I can get my feet unbedded, unbedded from that sand, I can move around in a way that you can't, right? So I'm sort of shifting and talking about like where our identity might be located. But, but so you kind of get what I'm saying. It's like at each level there's these different things going on and it, and it might be advantageous at any given moment to, to fix your position in that sand, or it might be advantageous to move it. Right. Same within the water, same within the air. It's just the awareness of what the state is. Cause we can grab onto, so to speak, any of those levels, we can take a stand and hold our position on a level or we can allow it to move. Now, if you think that yourself is that position, then you're going to fixate there against the world and then have fun being in constant battle with the world. But that's what happens to us with our various fixations and blocks. But so there's, th there's those three different levels. When you shift to the fourth level, now it, now it's like, okay, th there's a, there's a shift that is a, is a game changer because now sort of the logic of the first three levels no longer applies. If you want to learn more about the Dimension Approach, please visit dimensionapproach.com.